Hi, it's me, Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut. Uh, welcome to another, I, I don't want to call it quite a surprise Falcon Heavy launch, but frankly, it's kind of a surprise Falcon Heavy launch. These, these, uh, these USSF, the Space Force missions, kind of come out of the blue because they're quite literally top secret. So, uh, yeah, let's uh, let's dive into this and see what we can what we do know about this mission. So at least you guys know what to expect for today's exciting Falcon Heavy mission. For this, we want to head on over to a little website called Everyday Astronaut. You can go to everydayastronaut.com. You can click on upcoming launches, and there you will find our pre-launch preview for USSF 67. So let's just go through this here together as we do at the beginning of all launches. And remember, guys, I love it every time in chat, absolutely no matter what, I get almost the same questions. Uh, what time is this launching? Where is it launching from? What, like, what's the payload? Is it landing? Where is it landing? Is it landing on a drone ship? And all of your questions in that, in that regard can be answered right here. And we put it all right at the top. You don't have to read through anything. You just look one little glance and you go, oh, that's cool. There's all the stuff I need to know for this mission. So today, January 15th, 2022, that is today, correct? Yep. <laughs> uh, at approximately 2256 UTC, so 556 Eastern, uh, we are expecting to see the mission USS F-67. The launch provider, the, the company launching this payload is SpaceX. The, the customer for this is the United States Space Force or the USSF as you could likely imagine. The rocket for this, Falcon Heavy. This is going to be booster B-1064-2, so the second flight of one of the side boosters. B-1070, the first and only flight of the center core. And B-1065-2, so the second flight of that other side booster. The launch location for this is Launch Complex 39A uh, at Kennedy Space Center in Florida. The payload mass of this is, we don't, really know, but we think it's about 2,380 kilograms to about 5,380 kilograms. Top secret, baby. We don't really get a ton of information when it comes to these types of missions. Uh, where are the satellites going? Again, we have an idea. They're heading out direct to geostationary orbit. So they're not just doing a geostationary transfer orbit. That's where the rocket basically gets the, the, um, the satellite out on a really elliptical orbit all the way out to geostationary orbit, which is really far out. Um, but then the, the normally the satellite has to have its own propulsion system and slowly raises its periapsis, its lowest point in the orbit until it eventually circularizes and is phased and in the exact right position. And that can take months, literally months. So when you're in a hurry with something, when you need to get a national security satellite or something, you want to send it typically direct to geostationary orbit. So what that means is the rocket will not only get it into that elliptical orbit, it'll also wait the, what, five or six hours until it gets up to Apogee and it'll do another burn, which will then place it directly into geostationary orbit. So the rocket has to do a lot more work, which is exactly why you need the power of Falcon Heavy. Um, so will they be attempting to recover the first stage? Yes, the side boosters, no for the center core. This mission re demands too much energy from the center core. There's just not enough, um, there's not enough margin. There's not enough wiggle room to get this large set of satellites to geostationary orbit and still have the margin to land the center core. So um, the two side boosters will be landing back at landing zone one and landing zone two right there at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, uh, which is really nearby to the landing site uh, about, I think it's about 10 kilometers away, six miles or so away. It's 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 out there on the Cape. All the Cape's not huge, so it's relatively close. Um, yeah. So then the fairings will be recovered from the water as they tend to be recovered almost on every mission these days. It's just absolutely, that's become so routine and so normal that we don't even consider the idea that SpaceX is going to just throw away a fairing. It's pretty amazing. Um, but these fairings in particular are new. So they, uh, Brand new. I think when it's a, a mission like this, you want to make sure you have the newest, brightest, you know, this is probably a pretty expensive and extremely important mission. So uh, weather is currently nine above 90% go. And that was as of yesterday, actually. Um, this is the fifth Falcon Heavy mission ever. Um, this is the second flight of the side boosters, the 163rd and 164 booster landing, if successful. Uh, the 89th and 90th consecutive landing. So we're coming up on 100 consecutive landings of boosters. I mean, that's, think about that. Like, I remember when, when they did, you know, one and two, and it was still such a, like, I don't know if this is actually going to work out long-term. And now we're to the point where, like, 
consecutive landings, not successful. O almost 100 consecutive successful successful landings. That's incredible. Um, 207th overall mission for SpaceX. Can't even keep up. Third launch for SpaceX this year already. 60th launch for space uh, from Space Launch Complex uh, LC-39A. And the 10th orbital launch attempt of this year already. It's going to be a busy, 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 busy year. So, of course, guys, if you want to know more about this mission, there frankly is not a lot to know about this particular mission. Again, it's due to its top secret nature. We just really don't know a lot about it. And, you know, that's the whole point, right? Uh, if we knew a ton about it, I think we'd that probably wouldn't be a great thing. But there are – we do have a little bit of information like the continuous broadcasting augmenting SATCOM um, – yeah, still we don't know this, like, between two and 3,000 kilograms. Uh, but it's there's a handful of, of rockets or payloads on this mission. Um, and there's also the long-duration propulsive ESPA. Um, but, yeah, if you want to learn more about what's on here, what they're doing, we don't know a ton, like I said. But we do know a ton about the rocket and all of the things like that. So it's just crazy how these, these USS missions, these they come out of the blue. They literally just feel like they're, like, you know, all of a sudden we just get a, a little notice that like, hey, there's going to be a Falcon Heavy mission. You're like, wait, what? I think we literally learned about two weeks ago. Same with USS F-44. This one, I think, was about two weeks ago. And yeah. So um, everyone say thank you to Flo or Florian in, in chat as well as Trevor for writing this article. Uh, I just love our website crew who helps keep me informed because literally – these days, I can't keep... It takes a team of people to keep up with how many rocket launches there are. Literally a team. We have eight people, eight or so people that work just on the website to keep it up to date. I rely on our website to know what's upcoming, uh, what we're expecting to see on that on that launch. So yeah, bookmark the bookmark everydayastronaut.com. Uh, check out our upcoming launches. Keep that, keep that in the back of your mind. Another big one, too, that I should mention... Um, when I say big one, I mean big one. We do have this awesome article too. If you guys are paying attention to the Starship full stack Starship launch, of course, you probably can imagine I'm paying very close attention to this too. Um, this is the checklist that we have put together for when you could expect to see the orbital launch attempt. I've told people for a long time, um, don't worry about timelines. If, if even if, especially when Elon or even when Gwen Shotwell or, uh, you know, NASA administrator, even if they say we're expecting to launch uh, on February 10th, you know, just ignore that for now. Really, the most important thing to look at is the milestones. What like what is our checklist of things that we expect to see? So the full thing that we expect to see basically will be with the um, the the full stack testing. So far, we saw kind of a, a, a full stack testing, a little mild one here. Uh, but we're expecting a full stack test with the wet dress rehearsal, hopefully this upcoming week. Soon after that, we're probably expecting to see them de-stack, take the, the upper stage off of the booster and go into doing a 33 engine static fire. We expect to see that obviously before they launch. Um, and then somewhere around there, hopefully we start to see the FAA launch license and then expect to see the orbital launch attempt. But not until this whole thing is green. Once we have the green on the FAA launch license, then you should start really getting excited. But until that happens, any launch date you see is just purely a guess. And if you haven't been able to figure that out from the last year and a half of being a, you know, a Starship, if you're a Starship watcher for the last year and a half, you know what I'm talking about. As you've hopefully noticed, I try really hard to uh, keep you guys, your expectations tempted. I've been saying since they stacked um, Booster 4 and Ship 20, I said, don't listen to dates. Look at the milestones. And so far, uh, this is by far the furthest we've gotten to the milestones. So things are getting exciting. It is getting closer to that time to get hype about it. But I'm still waiting until they do a 33 engine static fire. Once that happens, and if that goes well, then it's game time. And yes, I will be there for the 33 engine static fire streaming from Mars with our awesome, awesome van. So Let's get to some of your guys' questions. Of course, as you guys know, uh, answer, ask some questions in chat. Our mods will, will pick them up um, and we'll hang out with you guys. And the fun thing, too, is obviously, you know, you don't have to do a super chat. I appreciate the super chats. Obviously, that, that helps fund all of the things that we try to do here. Uh, but let me just answer one that I that is a fun one to answer. Uh, what do you like more, Delta Four Heavy or Falcon Heavy? <sighs> My heart loves Delta IV Heavy. It's literally the first 
rocket launch that I actually saw because uh, I missed CRS three because uh, it scrubbed so many times I had to go home. My camera stayed there and I got pictures of CRS three. I didn't. Uh, I also went to OGO two, which was in like July of 2014. But the Delta IV Heavy, the first launch of Orion on EFT-1 in December of 2014 was the first rocket that I e actually saw the whole like ascent. So it has a really, really close place in my heart. That being said, how can you beat dual booster landings? How can you beat having two rocket boosters come back falling out of the sky simultaneously, nearly simultaneously, and landing propulsively? It's just absolutely incredible. I mean, this this rocket changes everything. I. It'd, it'd be irresponsible for me to say that, honestly, <laughs> there's anything that trumps that uh, at this point in time. So I got to say, uh, yeah, I got to go with Falcon Heavy. It's just incredible. Um, thank you so much to Geo for becoming a member. I really appreciate that. <laughs> Simon, uh, thank you very much for the pear emoji. Uh, laughing out loud. I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> uh, Maddie England, are Freemasons playing golf on the moon again? I don't. I don't think so. I, I don't think so. Um, oh, that's awesome. Dicey, Dicey Dino 97. Hey, Tim, I recently got the limited edition Aerospice, Aerospice, Aerospike engine shirt and also the full flow stage combustion cycle hoodie. They are really comfy. I love to hear that. I think our store is finally like caught up with orders from the holidays. Those poor people, they, they don't run just my shop. They run like a handful of like bands shops and uh, and stuff like that. And they get, sometimes they get really behind when they get slammed during the holiday season. Uh, but yeah, I am actually, Hey, I'm wearing the era spike shirt too. This is still easily one of my favorite shirts, uh, which is also why it is 10% off today. If you guys want to help support the show, uh, we do actually have limited. We did a second run of our limited edition gold aerospike shirt. This is still easily one of my favorite shirts. It's, it's gold. It's shiny. It's glittery. It's fantastic. Uh, 10% off of this shirt by going to everydayastronaut.com and use coupon code launch day, all one word, all lowercase launch day. You'll get 10% off this. Um, and yeah, as you know, our, our shirts are, are made here in the United States, uh, sewn on badges and patches and, and lots of fun little details that I think make them pretty outstanding. So yeah, you can uh, find that at everydayastronaut.com. The gold, the same with the, the green one is also for sale too, uh, or 10% off. So find that and guess what I think I already hear the stream is coming alive, my friends. This is awesome. Okay, good. I am making sure that you guys will be able to hear it. I think you already probably can hear the music in the background. I'm going to go ahead and I'll just go like this. We'll wait. Play the waiting game. I'm, as you can tell, I'm not on site today. Thank God. I, that is so exhausting. I can't handle that. I cannot handle that. Oh, no way. This is from Emperor Woof Woof. I love <laughs> Emperor Woof Woof. Uh, celebrating 23 months of, of membership. This will be the first Falcon Heavy launch I've seen. Looking forward to it. Shorten my name so it doesn't break the streaming software. Thank you. I noticed that too. It used to be Emperor Woof Woof of, of Woof in Stein Woof More or something really, really long and amazing. But it literally would like crash out of my uh, our chat system that we have that is in the back end because it was too long of a handle. If you really change it for me then you're amazing thank you so much for 23 months of membership and i can't wait i think tonight's launch is going to be incredible if i'm being honest like this is this is just got all the right parts for a uh for a really perfect launch actually you know what i'm gonna go like this that way i mean we're just looking at a logo that way we can all wait together um yeah and as those of you that know we do have obviously like our countdown clock here t minus 17 minutes and the SpaceX launch live stream, because of, again, the kind of classified nature. Yeah, they're, they're not going to be doing too much. So, um, all right, let's, let's talk about this. This is something that we get asked about often. Um, why is SpaceX not recovering the center booster? Is it because of the flight path? In a, in a sense, yes and no. So the, the way to think about this, the best, the most important way to think about anything in space flight is to think about how much Delta V do you need? How much change in velocity do you need altogether? So what that means, imagine you have a big heavy mass, right? On top of your rocket. How, how fast do you need to get that mass going? And unfortunately, well, or just the, the physics of it is the higher up your orbit is the faster you, you've had to go. Oddly, it's counterintuitive because actually the orbit itself is slower, the higher you go, but it takes more velocity. It takes more change in velocity to get up to those high orbits. So if you're just in low earth orbit, 
no big deal. You could launch, with the same rocket, you could launch a much heavier payload to low Earth orbit. Now, if you wanted to launch that same heavy payload out to geostationary orbit, you'd have to use a bigger rocket. So you can almost work backwards, like how heavy is my payload and where is it going? From that, you can take a look at your rocket and say, okay, how much of this rocket in SpaceX's terms, you almost say, how much of this rocket do I need to utilize? If there's some payloads that could use a fully expended Falcon Heavy because they're going to want to use all of the extra propellant that would normally be used for landing the boosters, they could be using that into getting that heavier payload further away or whatever the mission requires. Um, that would be a fully expended. That would be the most C3 or the most potential to launch something would be expending all the cores. The next option would be you basically do what this is, which is you, you know, detach the boosters, let them come back around, and then you actually drain all of the propellant. You don't use any extra margins for trying to recover the center core. And that, you know, puts a lot more energy into that payload to be able to get it up to that high, that higher orbit. Now, it's, you can almost think of it too, like when you look at say an Atlas V, a vehicle that can have different solid rocket boosters, you can almost think of it like, okay, a big heavy payload is gonna require all five solid rocket boosters to be able to get that big payload out there. Now, in the case, oh, here we go. Nice launch tractor and countdown net, pad is clear. Okay, we're coming up on the live stream. I can't wait to see what the skies look like and everything out there today. Um, well, actually, yeah, the, the, the next best thing you could do instead of, instead of expending them all would actually be landing the two side boosters downrange. If you need even more performance out of the side boosters, you can forego that boost back burn because that's, that's a decent amount. That's a good 10 or 15% of your propellant would be used for that boost back burn. So if you don't have to do that, you can actually get even more performance by landing the boosters downrange on drone ships, on dual drone ships. They haven't done that yet, but we do expect to be able to see that um, someday in the near future where, where they actually do utilize both two drone ships to recover both landing side cores like that. Oh, that's so cool. All right, let's pull this up and listen in here. Hello, everyone. You are looking at a live view of Falcon Heavy on historic Launch Complex 39A at Kennedy Space Center, awaiting liftoff at 5.56 p.m. Eastern Gorgeous. Time. Welcome to our live webcast of the USS F-67 mission from SpaceX headquarters in Hawthorne, California. My name is Jesse Anderson. I'm a production engineering manager here at SpaceX, and I am so excited to be here with you today, bringing you coverage of our first Falcon Heavy mission this year and fifth of all time. Today's mission is, internal power. is a national security space Crap, launch guys, mission. Guys, I fixed the audio today. I spent like an hour troubleshooting the audio, and it worked totally fine for me. So I really apologize. I even did like, I ran tests and did everything. Oh, I'm so sorry if it's really annoying. Why? Why is it doing this? Let me... Side boosters make their way back to land better? on landing zone one and landing zone two around the T plus eight minute mark into flight. Now, in addition to covering today's launch, we're excited to be joining you this weekend as Monday is Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Every third Monday of January, we celebrate the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who fought for racial justice and equality for all. Here at SpaceX, we believe that in order to achieve our goals of making humanity multiplanetary, it is essential to create a team with diverse backgrounds and cultures. As we remember Dr. King's legacy this weekend, I hope that we can keep working towards furthering equality every day of the year. Now back to the mission at hand at T minus 13 minutes and counting. All systems are currently go for an on-time liftoff. The vehicle is nearly fully loaded with propellants and will complete at T minus two minutes. The range is also green and ready to support. If for some reason we do not launch today, we do have a backup opportunity tomorrow at the same time. Now at just under T minus 13 minutes, let's take a closer look at the Falcon Heavy vehicle that you see there on your screen. Falcon Heavy is essentially three Falcon 9 rockets strapped together, which means it can carry much larger payloads, not only to Earth orbit, but to the moon and Mars as well. Now like Falcon 9, Falcon Heavy is a two-stage launch vehicle. Now the big difference is that Falcon Heavy, the Falcon Heavy first stage is comprised of three cores, whereas Falcon 9 only has one. Falcon Heavy has 
28 engines in total. Each of these cores has nine M1D engines, making for a total of 27 engines across all three boosters, which you can see there on your screen. The 28th engine is a Merlin vacuum engine on the second stage and will power the payload to its final targeted orbit. Now, all together, the Merlin 1D engines at the base of Falcon Heavy produce 5 million pounds of thrust. That's equal to 18 747s at takeoff. Now, in fact, the engines produce so much power that we don't run them at full thrust all at once until after liftoff. About two and a half minutes into flight, the two side boosters will separate from the center core and come back down to Earth for simultaneous landings at landing zone one and landing zone two, which you can see there on your screen. If successfully recovered, these side boosters will be refurbished and used in a future national security space launch. Now upon side booster separation, the center core will keep firing for about 90 seconds before shutting down its engines and then perform a standard stage separation from the second stage. We will not be attempting to land our center core today as the mission requires more performance. Now this means that in order to get our payload to where it needs to go for today's mission, the center core will burn the fuel that would, we would typically use for recovery. And for those of you looking closely, that is why you don't see any landing legs or grid fins on the center core. She now naked. moving towards the top of the vehicle, once the first and second oh, stage so separate, weird. the second stage will propel our payload to its intended orbit. At our customer's request, we will not be showing views of stage two. So immediately after the Merlin vacuum engine on the second stage fires up, we'll, di we'll be directing all of our attention to the landing of our side boosters. Now above the second stage is where our payload is safely enclosed inside of the fairing. That's at the very top of the rocket there on your screen. The fairing protects the payload from aerothermal loads, heating and contamination during ascent. Once we reach the vacuum of space, we will jettison the fairing as the second stage continues on its journey to orbit. And we will be attempting to recover the fairing halves today with our recovery vessel, Bob. Now, as I mentioned earlier, today's launch, USSF-67 is a national security space launch mission for the United States Space Force. Now, let's learn a bit more from our customer about today's mission. And here's where the copyright strike comes in with music. You do this enough times, you learn what things are going to be like, uh-uh, we're not doing that. Okay, we've got a, um, a of course, uh, wait, where did it go? Where did it go? Musical Wolves, of course, coming in with the fantastic questions. I just don't get how Musical Wolves, how you have so many awesome questions every time. Thank you so much for the generous donation. How long does it take the fairing halves to be ready uh, for between missions? We don't know. SpaceX doesn't publish that like they do the boosters. Um, but Trevor Sesnick, who is... Uh, who's in charge of basically tracking every bolt on a Falcon 9, uh, tries to track this and, and people literally will look at like soot markings and stuff on the fairings to try to figure out which fairing is which and which mission it's flown on. Um, but it's it's around m a month or two, in the, in, the, in the realm of months. It's not like weeks turnaround, it's not days. Um, it's somewhere, he's, he's actually trying to s figure out if, uh, if Trevor can if he can get us some kind of recent estimate of, of about how long it takes. But, you know, somewhere in the month or two-ish range. Yeah. Um, Hunter Allen, thank you so much for becoming a member. Okay, so back to this drone ship thing. Why can't they land all three boosters on drone ships and use the side boosters for longer? They can. There there was talks for a little bit about there being a all three drone ship landing. The, the hard part is, honestly, by the time you get into... The third, okay, so if the boosters are already landing downrange, that means they're going to be going faster. That means the center core is going to be faster. You're imparting more uh, velocity, allowing that center core to burn longer. So now by the time the, the center core is at stage separation, it's going to be going even faster, which actually means it needs to do an even more substantial entry burn in order to survive. So you kind of get a little bit of diminishing returns. The faster that center core is going, the harder it is to recover it. Um, and the more you have to do an entry burn because you're going faster so that the potential damage and the potential heating the vehicle will experience is more and more and more. So, uh, so yeah, why can't they land all three? Technically, they can. Um, there's really just a small little margin there. And it's most likely just easiest and probably most worth it, frankly, just to do what they're doing here today, which is, uh, I, I bet you it's probably not too different to expend the center core and land the dual boosters on land 
um, than it would be just to try to land them all downrange. I'll bet they're fairly similar. And I'm guessing, in my opinion, I don't know, I'm making this up. I'm sure Declan Murphy or someone could figure this out. Actually, that'd be a good question. Could all three, could the, if the dual boosters are landing and you expend the center core, is that going to be much different than trying to land all three downrange as far as total Delta V potential? Hmm. I'll look into that. But yeah, that's kind of, it's all these trade-offs, you know. So obviously the more you expend, the more you can put into the payload. The less you expend, the more you try to recover. And the easier you try to recover it, like landing back at land, takes away from your payload potential. All right, let's listen at in here. T minus six minutes and 45 seconds, the SpaceX team oh, continues to count down for launch of our fourth operational Falcon Heavy flight. And all systems are go. Following a successful static fire this past Tuesday, Falcon Heavy rolled out to the pad with the payload at 5.45 a.m. and went vertical about four and a half hours later. Now, before we began the webcast, the SpaceX and launch director... Booster, RP1 complete. The SpaceX launch director pulled the members of the launch team and got a go for propellant loading and launch. Now, we're currently loading propellant on all three first stage boosters as well as the second stage. Now you may be able to hear the live rocket sounds from our launch pad. The pops and hissing sounds that you hear are from propellant loading as well as the launch mount and strong back that the propellant is going through. Falcon Heavy uses two propellants, a refined form of kerosene called RP-1 or Rocket Propellant 1 as a fuel and LUX or liquid oxygen as an oxidizer. Now, an oxidizer is a type of chemical that a fuel requires in order to burn. The liquid oxygen is chilled below its boiling point so that it has a much greater amount of mass per volume. So basically, we can load more of it into the vehicle. Our fuel is RP-1, essentially a purified kerosene. It is safe, easily available, and has a lot of history. And in fact, the Saturn V first stage flown from this very pad on the moon missions also use liquid oxygen and kerosene. For the first and in addition to these two propellants, we also use the chemical TTEB or triethyl aluminum and triethyl borane as an ignition source. The combustion of RP-1 and liquid oxygen is what makes the rocket go and it's the T-TEB that sets the match to the propellant mix. We'll now be talking a lot about up, that. The trusted structure next to the vehicle. Thanks for pressing for a strong back retract. And there's that call out just in time. The structure next to the vehicle is called the strong back or the TE. And in preparation for retraction, the clamp arms will begin to open. There's clamp arms that just there that you can see on your screen below the fairing. Those will begin to open up, and once they are fully open, back retract in progress. Once they are fully open, then the TE or the transporter rector can begin to retract away from the vehicle. And we did hear that call out that the TE retraction process has begun. Now, as I mentioned earlier, today's launch marks our second Falcon Heavy flight in just 11 weeks. And for those of you following along, a lot will happen in the first four minutes of flight. And there you can see on your screen that the clamp arms have begun to open. Once those are fully open, the TE can begin to retract away from the vehicle. Now again, a lot will happen in the first four minutes of flight. First, we will light the two side boosters, followed by, booster lock float is complete. followed by the center core. And about 40 seconds after liftoff, we will decrease power on the two side boosters to prepare for max Q, after which Falcon Heavy will throttle back up to full power on the side boosters. Now, two minutes into flight, we will... booster lock load is complete. Two minutes into flight, we will again reduce thrust on the two side boosters, this time to decrease forces on the rocket structure, as the vehicle is now much lighter, but thrust is constant. Now, two and a half minutes into flight, we will fully turn off the side boosters with booster engine cutoff. I got to just point out, you can actually see the booster swaying a little bit. I, that is crazy. The, the twang in the booster, in the, in the fairing, just kind of the whole stack is just swaying a little bit. Then unlocks the two side boosters and pushes them away. Now, once we clear, once we are clear of the side boosters, the center core throttles up to full power until the center core shuts down with main engine cutoff, or what we call MECO, and then separates from the second stage around the four minute mark. And as a reminder, we will not be attempting to recover the center core today as the mission requires more, per more performance. Now, for those of you looking closely, this is why you don't see any landing legs or grid fins on the center core. 
And from this point on, very similar to Falcon 9, to a Falcon 9 mission, the side boosters will be making their way back down to Earth for recovery. The fairing will separate, and the second stage will take the USSF-67 payload out into space. Now, as a reminder, at the request of our customer, we will not be showing views of the payload, so we will be ending the webcast just after our side Stage boosters. Two, lock load complete. Just after our side boosters make their way back down to land on landing zone one and landing zone two, a little after the T plus eight minute mark into flight. And as we've mentioned before, launch is hard and Falcon Heavy is no exception. We are essentially counting down three rockets simultaneously, so our team is going to be conservative in case anything pops up in the last couple minutes of the countdown. Now, if for some reason we don't launch today, we do have a backup opportunity tomorrow at the same time. God, and we did beautiful. also hear those call outs that propellant loading is now complete on Falcon Heavy. This is going to be a so gorgeous launch. We are now launch. going to vent out the liquid oxygen line on the transporter rector. Next up will be Falcon in Falcon Heavy in startup, and that will be at the T minus one minute mark. That's where the internal flight computers take over the launch countdown. Oh baby, it's looking good. How are you guys feeling? Let's get a thumbs up in chat if you guys are feeling good about this one. Falcon Heavy is in startup. And great news, Falcon Heavy, now in startup. We're now just waiting there for the go. final call from the launch director. This is the mission director. Go for launch. And excellent news. All systems are go for launch of Falcon Heavy with USSF 67. Here we go. We got to go for the mission director. Everything's. 30 seconds. So it's going to be short, guys. Remember, they're going to cut the stream after the stage separation. I'll stick around. we got lots of questions to answer. We'll hang out for a while. But meanwhile, I'll start shutting up, and let's watch a gorgeous launch, and I'll get back to you guys uh, right at stage separation. T-10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1... Engine full power and lift off of USF 67. Go Falcon Heavy, go Space Force. Booster chamber pressures are nominal. Plus 40 seconds into flight under the power of 5 million pounds of thrust. Power and telemetry nominal. Falcon Heavy is headed to space. Now we did throttle down the engines around the T plus 40 second mark. Supersonic. Oh, in preparation for max Q. max Q. And great call out there that we have passed through max Q. That's the largest mechanical stress on the vehicle on ascent. And incredible, incredible views there on your screen. Falcon Heavy in flight. Oh, beautiful. It's... Now, next events coming up will be booster engine cutoff for Biko, followed by separation of the side boosters and followed by their side booster boost back burns. And then will be center core main engine cutoff or what we call Miko. And those events coming up here just under a minute away. That will be Biko. That's where the booster, the side booster's engines will shut down. The center core will push those side boosters away from the vehicle. Then those two side boosters can begin to make their way back down to Earth with their boost back burns. Beautiful. Absolutely. And on your right hand screen, you could see the views from each of those side boosters. I hope that you guys follow the Space Coast rocket photographers that are out there. Really incredible views here. Again, we will have yeah. Biko. It's going to be side gorgeous. Side booster boost back burn followed by main engine cutoff of the center core here in just a few seconds. Booster set. 
Wow. Southeaster separation. Dang. Side core booster startup. Incredible views we just had. Beco and separation of the side boosters, and you can see on your left-hand screen that the side boosters have lit back up. They are now in their boost back <laughs> burn, making their way back down to Earth. Those side boosters are returning to Florida under the power of three engines. That's three of the nine M1D engines. So next up will be the conclusion. Next up will be the conclusion of those side booster boost back burns, followed by Miko on the center core, as well as stage separation of the center core and the second stage, and then SES-1 or second stage engine start one. Now, as wow. I mentioned previously, per the request of our customer, we won't be showing second stage views after SES-1. And additionally, our center core or stage one is expendable today, so we will not be attempting to recover that vehicle, but we should have some great views like we are seeing right side now. Core, boost back, shut down. Those are we should long have some great views of those side runs. boosters touching down for landing. Miko. What, like a minute State of boost separation back? separation confirmed. And back start. And excellent views. We had the Stage one FTS to say has saved. We did have the shutdown of the boost back burn. We did have the shutdown of the boost back burns on the side boosters as well as Miko on that center core and stage separation. We are waiting for confirmation of a call out of the fairing separation. Those bright flashes, that's the, the little cold gas thrusters, but it's kind of occluded right now by all the soot. All the vehicles are following nominal trajectories. Since the, the boosters fly through the, the exhaust of the other boosters, so the, the cameras get really occluded during these, uh, all like messy, during these particular Falcon Heavy booster, uh, Falcon Heavy missions. But this is where, sometimes uh, when they relight for entry, it'll clear off the lenses here. You can just barely make out what's happening. That view on the left, the tracking shot is going to be the money shot anyway. Here we go. It's just falling back. Still 90 so kilometers. Currently, stage two is still making its way to its targeted drop off orbit while the boost, the side boosters are making their way back down to land. Again, these side boosters have another burn coming up. That will be the entry burn. That will be three of nine M1D engines reigniting. That helps to slow the boosters down in preparation for as they re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. What I was saying though, by the way, make sure you're following on Twitter. from those side boosters there on your screen. <laughs> And Instagram, all the awesome rocket photographers out there. At the time there. of separation, the side boosters were traveling slow enough to turn around and make their way back to land, to our side-by-side -side landing pads. If we have successful landings today, we'll mark the 163rd and 164th landing of an orbital class rocket. As I mentioned earlier, the center core it will be expendable, and we are not attempting to recover it today. Side core entry burn startup. And there you can see on your screen the entry burns for these side boosters have begun. They're nice and quick. Just about 12 seconds long. PY FTS has saved and NY FTS has saved. Do the one not do and one long And the entry enough? burns for both side boosters have now concluded. Now next up will be the final burn for each of these side boosters. That is the landing burn. It is just a single engine burn, the center E9 engine. Each one of these M1D engines have about 190,000 pounds of thrust. So that is enough to slow the vehicle down just in time for landing. And you could see the coast of Florida in the background. That seems like one are transonic. didn't slow down as much as the other. Now that it is landing burn coming up here in just about sooner. 20 seconds they, or so. They normally do stagger anyway. 
landing and burn will last about 20 seconds long. And again, we are scheduled to land on landing zone one and landing Bridge zone two. Landing burn. Oh. And there are those landing burns have begun on the side boosters. So let's watch as they touch down. Stage two is under guidance. Stage two, FTS is saved. Booster landing, we deploy. Come on. And what an incredible sight to see as we watch the side oh, boosters touch down for landing. That confirms successful landing of both Falcon Heavy side boosters on landing zone one and landing zone two. Now with these two side boosters, this marks the 163rd and 164th overall successful landing of an orbital class rocket. It's also the 25th landing on landing zone one and the sixth landing on landing yeah, zone two. And with Ridiculous. successful confirmation of our side boosters landing, that will bring today's webcast to a close. Now, we'd like to thank the United States Space Force for entrusting us with today's mission. Thank you to the Range and the Federal Aviation Administration for licensing today's launch. And we'd like to thank all of you, our viewers, for tuning in. Now, if you're interested, head over to our website and social media platforms for updates on our next missions and milestones. We hope that you all enjoy the rest of your weekend, and we'll see you again soon. Guys, they make it look too easy. I just don't understand Mad prop, SpaceX. That is honest. I mean, that's just... It, I can't begin to express how complicated what we just saw was. 27 Merlin engines. For the fifth time now they've done this. 27 engines all have to be lit and running fully operationally perfectly simultaneously. I mean, I just don't... I just... It just doesn't even make sense to me. It's such a hard... That really is such a hard thing to do. Which is also why I have I have a lot that gives me a lot of hope that Starship will actually work out with even though it has 33 engines because they've mastered you know huge number of engines before it's it's just not really even that difficult for them uh, they make it look so easy but then when you figure in all the staging events and having to program the telemetry and all the guidance and navigation for the both the boosters the center core the the second stage I mean it's just absolutely wild the number of staging events that they have. So let's let's hear it again. Little round of applause, everyone, for for the teams at SpaceX for making that possible. It's pretty pretty amazing. Um, and yeah, we I, I did see a we have a lot of questions. So let's get through these. I'm gonna hang out here for a little bit here until we get through your guys' questions. But let's start off with this one from Chris Sembroski. Hello, uh, an astronaut. Inspiration four. Hello, Chris. Uh, when the core gets expended, where in the Atlantic is its final resting place? I believe it's just over a thousand kilometers. I did have to ask Trevor Mall or Trevor, not Trevor Mall, but Trevor Sesnick how far it was. And if I re re recall, it was just over a thousand, like 1,050 or something kilometers downrange, or around a thousand. The fairings are about 1,400 kilometers downrange. Um, oh, 1,300 ish. Okay, Trevor updated it. 1,300 ish kilometers. So that's what, 750 or so miles? Uh, 1,500 kilometers downrange, so uh, yeah, like 950 miles, pretty far downrange, and and that's obviously due to like expending the center core. If they try to do a booster landing, I believe it's it's a lot less. It's something like 800 or something uh, kilometers downrange. So yeah, makes a makes a pretty uh, big difference. By the way, my parents are on the Gulf Coast of Florida, and my mom reported they can see it. My dad even has pictures out the back window of the condo. That is so cool. I love seeing that. That is so awesome. Uh, it just looked like a beautiful, beautiful launch. Like I was trying to say a few times, if you guys aren't following, you make sure you're following some of the awesome rocket photographers out there. I don't even want to begin listing any of them because then I'll forget. Uh, but you probably know the, the usuals. Go ahead and recommend some people to follow in chat. Like I said, I don't want to be the one to recommend because I will forget some really amazing photographers and videographers. Uh, but there will be incredible images from this up on Twitter and Instagram here uh, that I know are just going to be awesome. Um, all right, let's keep going here. So uh, Pablo M., thank you so much for becoming a member. Very appreciate that. Uh, this is from Arthur Ballion. So we're out at, at Vandenberg, obviously, for the Firefly mission. And unfortunately, without permissions, like it's, I, I can't just come take a tour uh, unfortunately, of any of any place, you really have to get a, a pr approval ahead of time, especially if there's potential uh, sensitive payloads. You know, like this type of thing, you can't 
I no nobody just gets to walk in the door even if you have we did have all base access uh, but we still weren't allowed to just show up uninvited to um, yeah to you know slick 4e or anything like that so all right uh, John Myers thank you so much again for becoming a member as well uh, so just a heads up to we'll uh, man I don't know depending on what the the Falcon or the starship and super heavy schedule ends up looking like, I was going to try to squeeze in a Patreon live stream here, um, Patreon and, and YouTube member live stream before I left. It Depending on what that schedule looks like, I might still squeeze that in here before I leave. If not, we'll probably have to do the test of our test stream of our, uh, our setup down there to make sure everything's going. That will be a Patreon and member live stream. So thank you so much for those of you that became a member. Uh, let's see, do our teams have any cameras on site? Not anyone with Everyday Astronaut, but... Uh, John Pisani with Cosmic Perspective does have a camera and uh, some cameras out there, and they're going to be fantastic. Um, Alex, when will the Falcon 9 models be back in stock? They are on their way right now, heading uh, to the United States. I'm guessing by the time we're going to do very thorough quality assurance <laughs> checks on this one after uh, a bit of a fiasco that we had with our last one with some inconsistencies and an actual manufacturing flaw. We did change a few things on this batch that I hope make it better. I pushed really hard to try to make it better and make uh, the best product we can. I think obviously when people are spending that kind of money, they deserve a really high-end product. Uh, so we made a few tweaks and I really hope that it's just absolutely perfect. So we're gonna be spending a lot of time doing Q&A before, or quality, yeah, Q&A, quality assurance, QA, 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 uh, doing some quality assurance before we even get close to setting them and putting them back up in the store. Um, so my current guess would be like mid-February would be approximately when we'd uh, be able to release that next batch. Um, let's see here. <laughs> I'm asking the models a lot of questions, the Q&A. Oh, man. Four months of memberships from the Crafted Films. Thank you so much. What's my favorite rocket? I, oh, I, don't, oh, I don't know. Uh I can tell you what probably would have been my favorite. If Energia had been become Energia 2 and you would have had the potential for a fully reusable uh, launch vehicle with the Baron system, uh, Energia and Baron, like that would have been the coolest thing ever. They would have potentially had flyback boosters that would glide and land on a runway. The center core would have, was going to be uh, you know, recoverable as well. That would have just been like the coolest thing ever. That would be hard to beat. It brings my love of so many things together, including the space shuttle, and it would have been just a much better space shuttle, and then also had kind of vibes of the Falcon Heavy and stuff today with the boost back and uh, the the landing boosters, although they would have landed on a runway, which still would have been really cool. Um, man, it's hard to beat the Saturn V. It's hard to beat Falcon Heavy. It's hard to beat the N1, even though, again, that's another one I wish we would have been able to see evolve more to be successful because it was right on the verge of, you know, so all, all of the N1s that flew only had those NK-15s, which were a very primitive engine. The NK-33 had a lot of improvements, uh, would have likely led to a lot more successful vehicle on top of a lot of other improvements. It would have been really fun. I would have loved that just because that vehicle was insane, but I don't know. I, I almost think at this point the Falcon 9, just because it's so reliable, well, let's, I don't know. I can't say. I can't say. Uh, Brendan wants to know, when is starting a rocket engine coming out? That will be, ooh, I hate date predictions. Don't make, here, and I'm going to, I'm going to give you the advice that I give to people watching Starship. Don't worry about dates, worry about milestones, right? So, um, I'll show you guys where I'm at with this. I posted a picture today on Twitter of, uh, of kind of the, the progress here. But this is, I just did a bunch of vo uh, voiceover work before we stopped, but here is the video uh, in process. A lot, every time you see one of those, I mean, I stack this baby with some awesome graphics and awesome B-roll. I'm really, really excited because it's hard to find innards of rocket engines. That's where you start to run into ITAR restrictions. So problems with, you know, things being too proprietary, too, you know, national security issues. So we have a, a decent amount of, uh, you know, animations and things like that too and just awesome b-roll I, I can't wait yeah it's so realistically i think i'm trying really hard Flo and trevor to not put a date on when i think it'll come out 
But the next step is I'll, I, I think I'm finished. I'm tidied up the, the voiceover work. Um, I'm taking Ca- um, Casper Stanley did just an incredible uh, inside, uh, like basically an RS-25 cut and half kind of a rendering or a, a loosely based simplified version of an RS-25 kind of sliced in half. And we're going literally valve by valve. Uh, and second by second through the startup process of the RS-25, along with charts and dials and knobs and stuff. We, I haven't begun to animate that. Casper has finished, mostly finished his. That's kind of the last step. I have no idea. That might be like a, a week-long thing. That might be a two-day thing. I just have no idea. But, yeah. <laughs> All right. So, uh, let's keep going here. <laughs> Wait, another, another, what's my favorite rocket? Guys, I don't know. I... I listed a handful, you know, my easy way to get out of the question. Uh, do I think Falcon Heavy will become obsolete when Starships with, with Starship almost here? So here's the thing. There will always be an overlap in technology. There isn't going to be a... The, so things like, you know, th- notice that it were five years after the inaugural launch of Falcon Heavy. And it took five years for the customers to come for Falcon Heavy, right? It took five years for the U.S. Space Force to come out and utilize the capabilities, build and and prepare satellites that are meant for Falcon Heavy, basically, right? They looked at the capabilities, they go, oh, wow, okay, we can fly this payload for how much? Cool, let's get going, get going, guys. And it took five years, basically. It had to get proven out first um, with, uh, what's, uh, not Arabsat, what was that other mission? The really cool, the really cool one. Um, I can't remember what it's called. It was just amazing. But um, anyway, the the market, you know, so these missions like like what, what launched today with a, a top secret payload, they're going to want to make sure that when they're, uh, you know, they're buying a rocket that is certified and ready to go and they build the satellite basically around the capabilities and around the profile of that rocket. So they're not going to all of a sudden switch. I mean, sometimes that does happen. Some payloads will literally be like, well, we were going to fly this on a Falcon 1, and now it's on a Falcon 9. Or we were going to fly in one web on a Soyuz, now we're flying it on a Falcon 9. Like, that does happen, but it's really rare. And especially when you have really expensive, you know, billion-dollar spy satellites or whatever. Yeah, they're going to be dedicated to those launchers that, that are they're being launched on. So Falcon Heavy still has a manifest, and that manifest likely won't change. I'm sure that SpaceX actually has been trying to just get people to buy on on starship missions but there's some that are just going to have to be dedicated to a falcon heavy where you just have the reliability of that um so that being said I, there's going to be an overlap there'll be like a five-year overlap between where starship and and falcon heavy are both flying even though they're flying similar profiles and similar payloads um it's just going to be a little bit yeah a little different uh crap sorry i missed this john myers where in the u.s can you see the launch the launch from you'd have to be it flew more or less due east, so it wouldn't be a great view up the coast, like some you know high inclination orbits, like uh, you know ISS missions and stuff, where you can see it up in like Maryland and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, uh, Lex Lexkey eighty one wants to know ULA Vulcan. You gonna watch it? Of course. Yeah, I'll watch. I don't think I'm gonna see it in person. I'm just I got so worn out trying to chase rocket launches in person with our streaming van and stuff. Uh, if I, if I do go and watch it, I'll probably just literally go and observe it as a casual observer, honestly. Uh, yeah, I I would love to try to cover that, but I, at this point, i got to just keep the van at Mars and just really prepare to do a good job with Starbase. Uh, could Falcon Heavy get us to the moon? Now, it has enough capability. To, to, it could send a Dragon capsule around the moon, and that was the original goal for uh, previous to when it wasn't considered Dear Moon, when Yusaku Maezawa purchased a ride to the moon, he bought a Dragon capsule on a Falcon Heavy mission. Um, so it's physically capable. Now, there's not enough Delta V, I don't think. Maybe nowadays, if you expended one or something, you could pr- probably get a uh, Falcon Heavy into, or get a Dragon capsule into orbit of the moon. But you'd have to have a separate spacecraft. You know, like the trunk would have to be a service module and all this stuff. I mean... Could it get us to the moon? Like, people, eh, yes and no, kind of, not really, maybe, sort of. Although it was never, it's never crew rated. They, they de- decided not to ever fly humans on Falcon Heavy, and it won't ever fly humans. So, no, but it can obviously get things to the moon. I mean, the electron rocket, the tiny little electron rocket can send stuff to the moon. Any, you know, a small rocket can send stuff to the moon. Falcon Heavy can send a lot more to the moon. Um... 
Thank you so much, Starship. Sorry that it, it got, didn't show up. <laughs> so, oh, God. I don't even want to think about that old Falcorn Heavy shirt, but I'm glad that you still have it. That's hilarious. An old inside joke from our Discord server like way back in the day. Russell Harrison, thank you so much for becoming a member. Um, oh, that's awesome. Michael uh, Foskett says, I got your space shuttle hoodie for Christmas and love it. Wore it in front of the RL-10 and J2 at the Science Museum in London. I want to go see that Science Museum in London. That is uh, looks awesome. So congratulations on wearing it in front of some awesome hardware. That's super, super cool. Uh, what's my least favorite rocket ever? The V2, <laughs> just because it... Any rocket, like that rocket killed a lot of people. I mean, granted, it's like the naughty grandfather, you know, it's the grandfather of all modern rockets, yet it was purely a missile and purely a, a weapon of destruction, unfortunately. So that would be um, either that or, <laughs> or Trevor, Ares 1. Ares 1 also was a was a not great rocket. Uh, yeah, I, I did. That was, if, you, if, you, if you're not familiar, it's basically a solid rocket booster from... Uh, literally from a space shuttle with a Delta IV like upper stage or a variation of it and an Orion capsule on top. It was such a silly rocket and would have been very, very, very dangerous. Um, oh, awesome. Jason, hoping to see a launch between March 9th and 16th. These days, if you are at the Cape for a week, your odds are really good that you're going to see a launch. I mean, they just launch so often now that it's it's easy to catch a launch. It was not that easy. I mean, when I first started going to launches in 2014, it was like seven or eight launches a year or something. Now we have 10 times that. It was a lot harder to see a launch back in the day. Yeah. Uh, have I considered my own personal experiment of uh, for my own uh, on the Dear Moon mission? I don't know what I'll be able to do or not do yet on that mission. We have not got that far along yet where we know exactly like the freedoms that we're going to have uh, on personal items and things like that. So... Um, I would love to, yeah, I actually do have some ideas. They, they might not be like science experiments, but kind of more public outreach things that I really hope to be able to do. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Mossmon in our Discord. What was the water one? Okay, well, that one. Uh, <laughs> Arca. That's also, I, I will go ahead and say that so far what we've seen from them has not been what I would consider a very great rockets. Um... All right, let's keep going. We have a lot here. Jeez, thank you guys. Okay, this is uh, celebrating 40 months of membership. It's about midnight in Germany. Tomorrow is a work day, but when a Falcon Heavy flies, you have to be awake. Greetings from Germany. Thank you so much for that, Patrick. I absolutely agree, and thanks so much for the continued support. <laughs> thank you, William. I appreciate the support very much. Um, same with Remastered. Uh, 29 months of membership here from Steve saying hello from the UK. It's, uh, yeah, almost coming up on midnight. Sat in my shuttle ejection hoodie, which is super awesome. Thank you for all you do, you're a legend. Well, thank you so much, Steve, for saying hi, and I, I really appreciate that. Um, this is, do you think it's possible to make a top the top half of a Starship into an optical telescope? Basically, a giant Hubble with engines would be awesome to see. Yes, I, I, I mean, realistically, these, like, why would you waste a vehicle... You know, when you could just let go of a, a dedicated satellite that could free fly. And that's the thing is station keeping of a satellite. You know, they do have to do a little, you know, maneuvers to, to look around and station keep and point and guide. That takes prop and electricity and, you know, reaction wheels, all that stuff to, to maintain. So if you have a 200 ton vehicle attached to your telescope, you're moving around a lot of mass that shouldn't be moved around. Like that you would prefer not to. So you really extend the lifespan of the vehicle if you just deployed a dedicated satellite now here's what's funny with you know you could have launched basically james webb space telescope fully deployed without all that scary complications and just made it as heavy as you want you could have made it 100 well if it was going all the way out to l2 you couldn't have made it 100 tons but you could have made it very 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 heavy and rugged and durable and just launched it all in one shot without the crazy unfolding that it experienced um with the capabilities of starship and and that will come i think the i think with the advent of starship truly gets down to like even if it's with 100 metric tons for a um, uh, $100 million, like even if they never get below, say, $100 million, because why would they undercut themselves so much? You know, like, sure, just why, why don't you sell it still at the Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy pricing where, you know, you're offering a huge payload capability or whatever. If, I don't know, whatever. 
even if it's like a hundred million dollars for and a hundred metric tons to orbit, that's going to open up the world of astro uh, of astronomy, space based astronomy assets. Like it's going to be crazy, absolutely crazy. If it gets down to like five million, and you could literally you could have amateurs sending up their own amateur, you know, telescopes basically, um, you know, for hundreds of thousands or something, which some high end amateurs would probably do, or, or colleges and, and stuff like that. Like it will change absolutely everything. <laughs> intensity stream watching your live stream of this launch will be the highlight of my 2023 to date well thank you so much for watching with me hopefully there's a lot more exciting things to come you know we're coming up on some big things like you know the super heavy stuff again i need i do need to remind you if, if you weren't here uh if you're trying to know when will super heavy launch go to everydayastronaut.com we have an article called starship orbital launch timeline checklist never listen i don't care who it is never listen to a date Pay attention to the milestones. When we see this all the way green with an FAA launch license, a launch is imminent. Then you should start paying attention to launch dates. Until then, literally anybody's guess. Literally the people working on the rocket right now really have no idea because they're doing so many firsts for the first time, fueling the whole entire rocket for the first time, top to bottom with cryogenic propellants. That's gonna be the most propellant ever loaded onto a vehicle ever. Like, that's a first. That's a big first milestone. We don't know what types of issues they may or may not run into. Same with the 33-engine static fire. They've never fired 33 engines before. This will be way more thrust than they've ever produced by th almost three times compared to the Falcon Heavy. Like, it's it's a lot. It's a lot. So until they do that and it's successful, don't even don't even worry about launch. Worry about the next thing. So the next thing we're expecting to see is the full stack testing and the wet dress rehearsal, kind of same thing. Um, those are expected around Tuesday. We're expecting those early next week. Um, then D-stack after full stack testing, then 33 stack after the D-stack. Um, yeah, then a final full stack. Yeah, that's, that's what you should be paying attention to. And those will be very, very, very exciting. Um, thank you so much from Davis Clute. I appreciate that very much. Thank you so much. A um, lot more. I'm really excited about this next video, the how to start a rocket engine video. It's going to be fantastic. Um, can you ask Elon, what can a non-engineer regular person start doing in order to be, to be picked for Mars colonization? I have no idea. He's, he's talked about that before, I think. And he kind of says, um, well, you know, I, I don't remember. It's, I can, I can ask him about that, but realistically, I think, you know, as far as truly trying to align your life to, to colonize another planet, I think you just have to be thinking about that every day and, and trying to make it so that you have a skill set that would be applicable to, you know, living on a hostile planet. So uh, I think people that, you know, live and work in Antarctica year round will probably be pretty good candidates for living on Mars. Like you should literally consider doing that. Um, you should maybe be good at welding and fixing things and just having general like you know, a good, a good sense of, of working with your hands and, and problem solving. So maybe it's building, you know, if you're a contractor, maybe it's electrical work, uh, maybe it's HVAC systems, and maybe it's, uh, you know, being, uh, working in a hospital, obviously, and, and having those skill sets. There's, we're going to need all of those things, uh, to be able to colonize Mars. Yeah. Thank you so much, Marcus. Good to see you around here. Thank you for becoming a member. Um, this is for Erasmus device. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And same with, uh, Will Evans. Uh, am I doing anything physically and mentally to prepare for my trip around the moon? Yes. Uh, currently physically, I'm, I'm just working on finally getting back into shape. I've been waking up, uh, and, and doing some fitness classes in the morning to just to try to, you know, make sure my, my heart and mind are, are in a good place. I always feel a lot better when I have time to work out and I'm making that a priority right now. Um, which is which is great mentally. Uh, that's part of what training does, honestly. I think when we get into actual training, like the, the daily training stuff, it, that that will prepare someone mentally, help prepare someone mentally, because then you know the systems, you know the the you know kind of the the what ifs and the whys and hows and the wheres and whats. And I think you just that's part that is part of training is is physically training so that you're mentally prepared and and vice versa. So I, I think, yeah, that uh, I, there's not, there's only so much I can do so far, but that's kind of some of it. Uh, Justin's holy cow. Thank you so much. Timmy, you do such a great job 
uh, getting people excited about space. Well, thank you so much, Justin. I That means the world to me. I mean, that's obviously the whole point of Everyday Astronauts, just to help make this stuff fun and exciting for the average person and, and hopefully remove, help remove and lower some of those barriers of entry. I really appreciate that. And, you know, I for me, I get most excited when I am educated on something, when I'm learning something. I know that when you get those questions answered, it ends up being, um, you know, just you never you never know what the chain of events will be and getting those gears turning and that little light bulb going. Yeah, it, it can tumble out of control. Look, at, I'm kind of the epitome of that. So thank you so much, Justin. There's more to come. I, like I said, I'm really, really excited to get the starting how to start a rocket engine video out for you guys. It's going to be fantastic. It's going to be great. Uh, thank you so much, Lee. I appreciate that. Uh, visible from New York, not on this one because it was uh, more or less eastbound, but I appreciate it. Um, no way. Oh, oh, Peter Muzzy. I know Peter Muzzy from Huntsville now, but originally from Cedar Falls. Good to hear from you. Thank you so much for saying hi. I appreciate that. That's awesome. Very cool. Uh, greetings from Massachusetts. Thank you for all you do. Well, thank you so much, um, Edmund. I appreciate that. All right. Um, this is from Jeff Grundy. If you don't do a boost back burn and just hit the atmosphere and did the normal entry burn, don't do a normal entry burn. Could you land on some land mass? I'm guessing, oh, I guess I'm asking if your trajectory would cross the Atlantic. Absolutely not. Not even close. We're talking something like, you know, at, at most we're talking about hundreds of, the problem is, especially if you start getting all the way out to the, like the other side of the Atlantic, like if you start getting over towards Africa or Europe, uh, then you start going so freaking fast, the boost back burn would be insane. Like you'd have to almost, frankly, I think you'd have to be almost at orbit. Like you'd have to be probably three quarters of orbital velocity or something, and then slow all the way down to a thousand kilometers an hour to survive re-entry going butt first like that on a skinny little pencil. Um, no, it's only going, I think at most we're about 1300 kilometers down range is and like 1500, I think would just be crazy down range. And I, I believe, you know, Europe's quite a bit further than that. Let me... Let me just take a look here at at a map and just kind of get a sense of how far. Uh, all right, let's let's do a little measure here. So let's just say Cape right there. We're just gonna do a sloppy version of it. I'm not gonna go exact. Measure distance from there to the absolute closest would be something like this, and that's four thousand kilometers, almost six thousand or six thousand kilometers, four thousand miles. Oh, sixty-five hundred uh, kilometers. Portugal. You know, or 6,600 miles, Ireland, um, 6,300. So yeah, it's pretty wild. Iceland, 3,500. Greenland, then you're overflying some of the states. So th I, yeah, I think I like that they curve that. That's cool. I've never tried measuring like that. That is awesome. That helps a lot, actually. But yeah, something something like 6,000 plus kilometers. So it's it's a very 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 long way. Um, and, and you don't really gain, I don't understand why people want, I, I get, we get asked this question quite a bit. And like you don't, you actually end up having more work to do if you do land on another landmass. Because then you have to unload it there, put it still on a ship, then get it back here and unload it from the ship. You might as well skip a step of having to like unload it and, you know, from, from the landing pad and get it onto a ship and just literally land it on a ship. Like you'd be better off landing 10 kilometers off the shore and landing there um, and then driving it back to the port and unloading it versus landing it, loading it onto a ship, shipping it across the ocean, unloading it. You know, it's it's funny because it, it's it seems like land is is a big deal, but it's really the the actual, they've kind of solved the, the drone ship landing for the most part. Like they're very, very, very good at landing on a drone ship. It's not like that's, they're so precise. They don't. The only thing is sometimes that the sea states can be a little bit too nasty, but it's rarely an issue. So you're not really gaining much by by trying to land um, on a, on another landmass. Uh, thank you so much from Rad Review. I appreciate that, and from David Chamberlain. Also appreciate it very much. Um, yes, I love the the views of the boosters coming back. Always makes for Falcon Heavy really really exciting. Uh, this was for the. This is for the United States Space Force. Again, anytime you guys have questions about upcoming rocket launches, don't forget to check out um, our, well, now it's a previous launch. Notice how that happened already. It's now in the previous launch. And look, by the way, we have, you can filter out stuff, which is so cool. Uh, you know, you can filter out between Falcon 9s, Falcon Heavy, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So 
Uh, yeah, this one, you can read about it. It was the United States Space Force. I think we also have that in the description, too. Uh, but thank you so much. Um, Sweden had uh, had open Sweden had opened a satellite at uh, S range in Karina, Sweden, and they also will try to start using reusable rockets. Don't know if they will use Falcon 9 or de or develop their own rockets. They won't be using the Falcon 9. The Falcon 9, uh, any any like that's going to only be operated by SpaceX. And so far, they have you know four launch complexes. They have uh, West Coast with at Vandenberg. They have two at the Cape. Well, technically one at Cape Canaveral, one at, at Kennedy Space Center, despite them both being on like Cape. Um, and then they have Starbase. So there there is no plans for you know Falcon 9 launching anywhere else. And yeah, but if they're trying to reuse a rocket, that is definitely the name of the game right now. Definitely the name of the game. Oh, that's so cool, Hunter. Thank you for sharing with us. Uh, came back from the Cape Beach. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for, for watching with, with me, Hunter. I appreciate that. Uh, will there be a Starship Super Heavy? Yes. That's, um... Oh, like... Like a Starship Super Heavy Heavy? Or like a starship heavy because that's confusing because they they call the, the the booster super heavy so um it is confusing but let's see here yeah because don't forget we're, we're talking about the booster is called the super heavy booster so elon's mentioned before that falcon heavy was a bit of a mistake in, in some ways that that attaching strap on boosters is actually a lot more complicated than just making one big booster right so I think in the long run, he, he tried to cancel Falcon Heavy a few times. And literally at one point, Gwen Shotwell ran in, the president, and she runs in and goes, you can't cancel Falcon Heavy. We have customers waiting. So uh, he tried to cancel it because it is more complicated. It's not worth it. So you're better off, especially once you get into Starship, if you need to go bigger and you need more power, you need more payload, instead of attaching more boosters and add, adding all that complication, just make a bigger booster. Uh, make a bigger rocket. Actually, it would be cool if they made a... It, it would be fun to see if they, like, had a 9-meter-wide uh, starship on top of, like, a 12-meter-wide booster or something. I think that'd be fun. But, yeah, um, we I don't think we'll see, like, strap-on booster cores for Starship or any other future SpaceX vehicle because of how hard it was. Um, Taldron, I remember watching in awe during the D DCX flight and hover tests. Imagine a day when this would be a commonplace, and here we are. It took... 20 some years but yes the dcx was an amazing program they use they use i believe it's four rl10 engines i can't imagine propulsively landing with the rl10 since it it bootstraps and it has a such a slow startup process uh, it just seems like that'd be so hard and so finicky yet they made it look so uh, they knocked it out of the park i mean that was incredible if you guys haven't seen the dcx this was one of the coolest rockets honestly way ahead of its time um, the, here, here we go. Yeah. Like I said, I'm pretty sure I had four RL, RL10s. Yeah, RL10s. Um, but look at this thing. I mean, how cool is that? Now that's a render, but they actually flew some, some relatively high altitude, like pretty high altitude. And unfortunately, uh, yeah, unfortunately the last one did tip over and, and one of the landing legs didn't work. But the, the guidance and navigation of that vehicle was incredible. Same with the, I mean, the engines and everything. Fantastic. Uh, how many flights have these boosters made? The boosters, that was their second launch and landing. So they are now a Dash 3. 10, what was it? 1064 and 1065. Again, we can go to our previous launches on our website. Falcon Heavy. Click on the most recent launch. Uh, it was B64-2 and B65-2. The next time they fly, they'll be B64-3 and B65-3. Um, thank you, Stephen, though, for that, that super chat. Um, from Elmar, just got back in the house about 20 kilometers from 39A from uh, watching launch. Finally got a good view of the boost back in entry burns, but landing was behind the house across the street. It looked like phenomenal skies. Like I said, my parents over on the Gulf Coast could actually... Uh, could actually see it for the most part, which is crazy. I mean, that's hundreds of kilometers away. So that's, it looked like a perfect night. Um, let's see. This is from JTK9LTW. Center first stage obviously had differences other than the outer boosters. No grid fins or differences in the outer boosters. No grid fins, landing legs, and color. Uh, what other differences are there between the boosters? So 
the center core nowadays is basically a completely bespoke vehicle on its own. It doesn't share, I mean, obviously it shares some similarities with, you know, normal Falcon 9, but it has actually like a totally different thrust section uh, that that's, holds on to, because it has to ho take all the extra force. There's like, um, you know, there's, there's forces coming in from the sides as the boosters actually want to push in. So the interstage has to be beefed up like crazy. Uh, the whole stack has to handle higher loads through it with, with potentially heavier payloads going down the, down the center stack. Um, it's basically just a beefed up uh, Falcon 9 without any of the recoverability when they're, when they're doing these uh, without recovering. Uh, since SpaceX successfully landed its first booster, how many boosters have failed to land? Well, Trevor, are we keeping track of that? Are you keeping track of that? Because at the beginning, for a long time, it was, it, it wasn't, you know, it was quite a, quite a few were failing to land after Orbcom 2. Um, but, I mean, these days, it's been so long since they've had one not land. I think it was a Starlink, like Starlink 5 or something. So just way, way, way back in the day already, like 20, early 2020, coming up on three years ago, I think, since they had their last failed landing. Where And, th and that was because the failed landings weren't like, land, you know, missed the landing. It's because it had like an engine problem on, the, on ascent and uh, wasn't able to even attempt a landing. Uh, Alice, thank you for becoming a member. Uh, Andres, how many flights has Falcon Heavy been commissioned for this year? Well, we know there's, a, what, another, like, four or five Falcon Heavy mission? We can see, um, I think there's an upcoming, okay, here we go, this is what I'm thinking, so, okay, so, in progress, yep, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, there's like there's a dozen or so on the manifest, and this year we might see up to um, one, two, three, four. We might see up to four more. Don't don't be surprised if those move around. I I, I expect to see two more. We'll definitely probably see the other Space Force one. Um. Yeah. We'll probably see two or three more. All right. Um, oh, that's so cool. Jake Harvey, I saw that incredible render like Kendall Dirks did of your of your daughter's Falcon Heavy. That was so cool on, on Twitter. Yeah, you definitely have to look at Kendall Dirks' render of that. That was just amazing. Oh, here we go. Quality is interesting. Thank you for, letting, for informing me. QA is done before the product is made. QC is after. There we go. I misspoke. We'll be doing a lot more QC checks this time uh, before we get to shipping any of the new Falcon 9s out. So there we go. Um, Here we go. Let's see. Scott wants to know, uh, are, after strong back retraction, what is holding the weight of the rocket? Uh, it's still sitting. So the strong back actually really isn't holding the weight. That's that's down to the actual ground support, the the launch mount, the launch clamps, and there's literal clamps that are like holding on to the core at the bottom. The the strong back is there to, it it does hold it, you know, it, it does hold it, especially it helps take it from horizontal to vertical. That's the transport erector portion of the strong back, um, that physically stands it up. Then it also has the umbilicals, the attachments that that feed the upper stage with with propellant feeds uh, keeps you know the the fairing under the right conditions and electrical and all that stuff uh, attached but it, and it is kind of hugging the rocket from from wind forces um, but it's not physically holding any weight up it's really just kind of hugging it and then so once it lets go that's actually why you started to see the rocket uh, just slightly twang back and forth rock a little bit in the wind and just with a little little tiny bit of momentum a little if there's a little bit of uh, inertia pushed into it during any of that process, it's going to sway for a long time. It's, it's out there on a very long lever arm. Funky Cold Medina, thank you so much for the membership. Um, have we had de descent telemetry? Yeah, we've had des descent telemetry for a while now. We, we normally see what we need next is, is both boosters telemetry because we were only seeing a single booster. But for Falcon 9 missions, we've seen telemetry on the boosters 
for probably two years now or so. Um, let's see here. Snow181. Uh, as usual, great stream. What do you see as the solution for the standing ISS personnel? Well, uh, they're flying. They're going to be flying another Soyuz up there here. Uh, I think in February. <clears throat> so, assuming that, that that everything is fine, you know, there's not like an emergency case. They will wait for that and then return on on that Soyuz. It'll be an empty Soyuz, right? It'll fly autonomously, which is basically what the Progress vehicle does. I mean, they they have tons of experience flying and docking uh, completely autonomously. So that's the solution is Roscosmos is flying an empty Soyuz. The three cosmonauts, or the two cosmonauts and one astronaut that, that flew up on it, I believe are just flying down on the other one. And they still will re-enter MS-22. Um, yeah. Then, uh, and we'll see how that does. We'll see if it would have survived and if it would have been safe, but they're just not taking that risk. Uh, thank you so much to uh, Invernomudo. <laughs> Casper, not finished. You're not quite finished. You're really close. I don't know what you're talking about. You're really close to, to finish with that, that render. It's, it's amazing. Um, could Raptor engine replace Merlin engine in the future? No. Those two things, you can't stick a Raptor on a Falcon 9. Uh, the Raptor engine is, is ushering in the, a new vehicle. If they wanted that kind of capability, I don't No, I mean, the Raptor engine and Merlin engine will coexist. The Raptor engine, I guess in a sense, is replacing the Merlin, but it won't be doing so on the Falcon 9. They'll just, the, the Starship, once Starship is flying and operational, it'll pretty quickly eclipse and, and get all customers that would have been flying Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy missions. Like I said, expect about a five-year overlap, really, probably with the two flying simultaneously. But once Starship is totally proven out, it'd be silly to fly on anything else. Uh, and in which case, at that point, the Raptor engine, I guess, will have replaced the Merlin engine, but not physically on. Uh, I talk about that. I have a video called uh, the Falcon Starship versus Falcon 9, like what's new, what's different. And we, we talk about, like, why can't they just use the Raptor engines on Falcon 9? Well, first off, it's not Kerbal Space Program. You can't just, you know, like, you know, plop a different engine out. Uh, the, the Raptor's a lot bigger, so you're physically not going to be able to fit nine Raptors on the, you know, on the same diameter, that 3.7 meter wide diameter of the Falcon, uh, of the Falcon nine won't, wouldn't fit nine Raptors. You'd probably maybe be able to do like five, but then you actually now are even producing even more thrust, believe it or not, than you would be with nine Merlin engines. Um, so you're going to have more stresses on the vehicle. Your bulkheads are in totally different places. So you're going to have different tanks, different considerations, different startup processes. Um, now your thrust to weight ratio is going to be really high when you get down to one engine for landing burn. Like it's already really high. It's already so high it can't hover. Now all of a sudden you're doubling that thrust, more than doubling that thrust. Uh, it's going to be even harder to land with if you had one. The second stage, which already is overpowered with one Merlin vacuum, now will have even twice as powerful Raptor engine. It's just it's it's a totally different vehicle. You would be designing a new vehicle. That's you you design the rocket around the engine and not vice versa. You don't design a rocket. I mean that that does happen. Like you have. You know, we do occasionally see an engine get swapped out. Like Antares went from, you know, basically flying NK-33s, but the AJ-26s uh, swapped that out and, and put in the RD-181. Uh, but the RD-181 was basically customized and made to fit as a replacement. So they didn't have to do huge, massive amounts of changes. Obviously, there still were changes made, but uh, but it was the same class of engine. I mean, it has a little bit higher performance than the uh, AJ-26, but it's within the same realm. You know, Raptor's on a totally different scale. Um, <laughs> thank you so much, Chris. Great hearing from you again. I love it. Uh, yeah, the, that, that, that new Glenn, as you know, is awesome. Can't wait to see it fly. Mel, thank you so much for becoming a member. Very much appreciate it. Uh, Tim, what's, uh, what's my opinion on Virgin Orbit last week? I don't really have much of an opinion. We don't have much data on it. Um, other than, I mean, yeah, I, there's almost nothing to go upon yet. It's, it's a total shame. You know, obviously that's not what anyone wanted. That's not what the customer wanted. That's definitely not what Virgin Orbit wanted. That's not what the UK wanted. Um, not great. We'll have to wait and see what the results are, what, what failed, what went wrong to hopefully make for a more robust and, and better rocket. I personally, I, I don't fully see the value in, uh, in air launch it kind of has a limitation of like how big can you make a rocket that can fly on a on an airplane you know and why fly your your launch pad when 
launch pads work just fine on the ground. Why drop your rocket before you start the engine? Because what if, you know, lots of times, how many times does a rocket start, go th- begin the startup process, and then scrub and shut down and be like, oh, actually, there's a problem. Like, if you drop it, <laughs> it's like, oh, that would have been nice to test before we dropped it. Um, I, I, It's cool. I love it. There's some capabilities that it does have that are, are really hard to match. But I just still, I'm not, I'm not really sold on it um, in the long term. I do think there's, but like I said, there's some really cool things. I do want to see commercial success out of it. Um, I, I think it's a really cool vehicle. I think it's a really cool system. And uh, I know the people that work on it work their butts off. I've, I've been in Virgin Orbit's factory, seen the vehicle up close. It's a lot bigger than you would imagine up close. And I think they've got some upgrades, you know, in the pipes at some point. Um, you know, they can get more performance out of the vehicle, which would be awesome. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, it, it's, 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 it's so conflicting for me because in some ways it's so cool. In other ways, it's not practical. In some ways, it's actually really practical. It's just like, it's, it's this whole like conundrum for me. I don't know. Those are my opinions overall of the, of the failure itself. I don't really have much of an opinion. Uh, do I know when they are planning to retire Falcon Heavy? Because it looks like Starship will be fast track after the initial test launch. Yeah. I mean, like I said, once they get through the manifest of customers. And if, you know, I'm sure as Falcon, as, as Starship flies and becomes successful, the customers will drop off and start switching over. And once there's no more customers, then like I said, I expect probably a five year overlap of the two existing uh, where, um, yeah, of the two existing. Um, I, yeah, I, I love when Elon focuses on, on SpaceX and Tesla. I think those are two companies that were extremely inspirational very uniting. Like, I think those are things that everyone can cheer for because they expand our, you know, our technology uh, rapidly. They expand our, our presence. I just love when Elon Musk talks about those two companies. Um, I've talked a little bit about this on, we, we did a, a, a episode of Our Little Christmas Future and I, I talked about it more there. I don't, I don't feel like we need to dwell on someone else. I don't know. I just think there's not much to say. I'll just say that I, I really like when Elon talks about rockets. Uh, it's, it's, it's great, but I'm also not going to tell someone what to say or what not to say either. I I wouldn't want that from someone else. Like I actually don't like it when people tell me like, stop tweeting about your music. I'm here to hear about your rockets. It's like, that doesn't feel nice. Um, you know, I don't love all that stuff either, but I just love rockets. Just stick to rockets. Uh, so-called Jerry, uh, John Krause posted an amazing photo of tonight's launch with the gorgeous nebula. Check it out. It's on that bird social network. I think I know which one you're talking about. Um, I'm always in an incognito tab here, so I will have to find him. John Krause. John Krause. In the middle of our house. Why can't I? Someone link. I'm just going to find it over here and then just copy pasta. John Krause. Oh, there it is, John Cross Photos. Okay, let's find this. If we play this game too long, though, we'll be sitting here looking at all the amazing images for the next five hours. All right, what do we have? Oh, that's pretty nice. Oh, that's very nice. It looks like it's spelling something. Look, you can actually see the two boosters. That's insane. That's so cool. Ah, what? No. Oh, there we go. Wow. Unbelievable. <laughs> I love that. That's really cool. Great work, John. As always, I don't even expect any less. I mean, wow. I got to I got to just comment. That is, that's really good. That's really good. Yeah. John's great. There's so many talented people out there. And I love seeing their work every, the dedication these, these guys have. These men and women to producing content out there. So cool. Um, Starship will negate this, but would a quad core Falcon Heavy enable direct lunar orbit insertion? Uh, so again, no. I mean, there it already can do a direct lunar orbit insertion if it wanted to. It just won't have much payload mass. All you're doing when you're adding extra cores is adding a little extra uh, capability, a little extra C3 technically. And it's you get diminishing returns when you are just stacking... Um, boosters especially if you're not like making a bigger better upper stage like if they if they had five cores if they had you know four strap-ons around a center core and then they had an even bigger 
like five meter wide upper stage with a Merlin vacuum. That would actually be really cool. Just carry the diameter of the booster all the way down to the inner stage, basically. If they did something like that, you could they would probably actually get a lot more performance out of Falcon Heavy. Um, but yeah. Let's see here. Andre. Hey Tim, might be a dumb question, but do you think that when the busters are doing boosters are doing a boost back burn? It gives the second stage a little push. Uh, no, that's... Uh, I wish. I wish. I, I see what you're saying. I mean... I don't think so. I mean, you are imparting a tiny, tiny bit of inertia if those particles hit it and bounce off. I just don't think it's very great. Uh, you, yeah. I don't know. All right, I'll keep going here. That's, you got me thinking now how much, I mean, it would have to be a lot quicker. You'd have to like literally turn it around very, very quickly. But I don't think it'd even catch up. We'd well, have those particles, run, oh man. Now you got me really thinking. I'll have to think about that more. It, I'll have to think more, as Mitch says. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, oh, I know, I know about the Spire Museum, but I have not been there and I want to go there literally just to see the Buran. Um, it actually wasn't an unflown one technically because it, it was one of the glider prototypes. So it actually kind of did fly, but it wasn't ever meant to be orbital and it would never would have been orbital. Uh, Gagino, thank you so much for the membership. Uh, naturally Herb, thank you so much. Um, if SpaceX... Uh, deemed it safe, would you ride Falcon Heavy as is? Oh, if I'm on a Dragon Capsule, yeah. Oh, 100%. 100%. Unless you mean like riding a booster. I don't, I'm not ready for that. I wouldn't want to do that. But uh, yeah, I would absolutely ride on Falcon Heavy in a Dragon Capsule. That would be, to me, very, very safe. You have the abort system, the proven technology of the Dragon Capsule, and frankly, the, the ride would feel similar. You'd only need to do that if you had to go further with a Dragon Capsule. That would be cool, though, to get sent like way out to... You know, you know, yeah, you know, out to the the moon or something. All right. Um, as putting stuff in space gets cheaper, wouldn't in space automated assembly lower the need for large rockets like Starship? Eventually, I mean, we're talking about. Well, then again, there is there is actually at some point you really come into the fixed costs though. There is um, a scaling that happens like when you have a large, large, large rocket, um, you are physically your mass fractions get a little bit better with the tanks because your your outer tank uh, goes up by the like the the, the diameter goes up by the radius cubed while the area goes up by the radius or squared by the and then the, the area goes up by the radius cubed so you actually physically are able to fit more propellant in uh, obviously your, your tanks gonna have to get a little bit thicker the, the bigger it gets etc etc et but it actually is more efficient to make a larger rocket in that sense. Also, you have fixed costs like the range, the personnel on console. You have the all of these, you know, costs built in that are the same or more or less the same, no matter the size of rocket. So obviously, launching an electron is going to have the the people to launch that that rocket is going to cost, we'll say, two hundred fifty thousand dollars per launch. Well, if you have a rocket that's a hundred times, you're not going to have a hundred times that cost of personnel. Uh, so that fixed cost stays close to the same. So you actually get a lot of efficiency by flying large rockets. Uh, there's a lot of logistics and things that get a lot harder, but those are solvable things. And it, it eventually it just does scale that. It's It seems to make sense if you project all that out that flying a bigger rocket just gets better. In space stuff, like automated assembly and stuff, yeah, that's... But then you say, like, why wouldn't you do that automated assembly with while flying a large, large rocket? Like the best of both worlds, you know? All right, um, you got to see the Falcon Heavy from Maryland. I that's crazy, that's awesome, very very cool. Congratulations! It looked like a, a perfect night for that. Uh, thank you so much, Marco, for the tip. I'm sorry that we can't read it. I don't know. I don't remember what exactly causes that to happen. Uh, Aggie Woody says, "So stoked for Dear Moon." When they first announced it, I thought, "Then man, I want Dot on that one." Well, here we are, my friends. That's uh, going to be just crazy. Let's see here. Uh, thoughts on Elon suggesting. Indentured servitude for Mars colonization. I don't remember him saying anything like that. I think, 
a lot of stuff he says, and I know I'm, I'm not meaning to like defend him, but having physically spoken with him a handful of times, a lot of things he says, if you picture the voice of like someone in Monty Python, like going, da da ba ba ba, like, oh, they're going to be in forever indentured servant, you know, like he's saying things very sarcastically often. And I know that people won't accept that answer because they just won't believe that that's what he's doing. But like, I remember a long time ago, we had a tweet like, We'll coo who we want to coo. And I think he literally has said that before on camera. He's like, we're going to coo whoever we want to coo. And he said it like in the, in like a Monty Python voice. And he realized it's just like a, it's a, it's a, it's a joke, but it does not come across on Twitter. So half the time when something, not, not all the time, not all the time, but there are occasions when something is said where you're like, are you serious? And then like, if you say it in that voice, like, oh, that's probably what he was doing. Not all, like I said, not all the time. I'm not, I'm not going to defend everything he says, but. Just letting you know. Uh, can you say anything about today's center core? How many flights? Zero. Well, one. It flew once. And it's never flying again. It was a, a brand new center core. I think that's basically what we're going to see for from now on. As a matter of fact, if we look at Falcon Heavy, you can see. Uh, I don't know if these mention it. But I, I'm pretty sure there's like literally only one that will be recovered, I think. And that's Psyche. I think Psyche is the only Falcon Heavy launch that is going to be a recovered center core is that right or is that one or is that the one that's fully exp or is that the dual downrange landing psyche i already forgot i don't think we're going to see a recovered falcon heavy booster maybe maybe ever yeah i agree with trevor on that one um <laughs> is it true or just a good story that elon musk made a starship more pointy the space shuttle's external tank is actually equally pointy uh, I think at one point they literally were trying to just figure out the mold line for the nose cone. And he said at some point, well, can we just make it more pointy between the options? And yeah, they went with pointy because it looked cooler. So that I think is a true story. He, he's told that a few times on a few different podcasts. 13 um, year old from Scotland. Your videos are very inspiring. Can't wait to see you pass the moon. Thank you so much, Space Podcast. Welcome. And thank you for saying hi. I appreciate it. Hopefully, uh, hopefully I'm on that rocket flying around the moon before you go to college. <laughs> Steve Hawking, thank you, Hawkins, thank you so much. Starship will fail due to damage from lack of flame diverter. Why doesn't uh, he, he, don't forget, there's more people that work at Star, uh, SpaceX and Starbase than Elon. So I'll say, why don't they install a flame diverter uh, after all the past damage? Well, I mean, they obviously know stuff that we don't. After the 14-engine the fire, they had an, a 14-engine static fire. It actually held up pretty well. I think that wouldn't have destroyed... Um, destroyed the vehicle you know you're claiming here that starship will fail due to the lack of a flame diverter i didn't really see any evidence of the 14 engine static fire that would have led to damage of the vehicle due to a lack of the flame diverter so i don't think i you know i i think they obviously have run the numbers like w how much force at what velocity and temperature is the is the exhaust hitting the ground where is it going to go how's it going to dissipate and they've run the models um but i do i yeah i I obviously do kind of want, I, I wish they had a flame diverter. I think it'd, it'd look really cool. Um, but they obviously have run some numbers and somebody has checked off on that going, no, this is actually fine. It, the best part is no part. And they obviously think they, they don't need it, but we will see. Um, yeah, there was, currently there is actually a, at McGregor, there is a, a flame diverter jig. I, I don't know. I wouldn't be, I would not be surprised to see a flame diverter, but I have not heard anything about that yet. It would make sense. Uh, the fairing recovery was 1,500 kilometers downrange for this mission. Uh, if that's an idea of how far this ballistic trajectory. Yeah, like I said, the um, the the center core was about 1,300, and the and the fairings were 1,500. Thank you so much. Uh, Diana, thank you so much for that. Let me see if I can find. Holy cow. Oh, no, I can't read what it says. What did it say? Thank you so much, Diana. That is... Very, very, very generous. Hang on, I'm looking for it now. Oh, I can't scroll up enough. Wait, here we go. I can click on this. Oh, I well, unless I messed something up. I don't think Diana said anything. Diana, thank you so much. Everyone, everyone say thank you to, to Diana. That is, you guys, that's really, really, really generous. I appreciate that so much. But thank you so much, truly, from the bottom of my heart. I mean, I can't wait to, hopefully, I continue to make you proud. And hopefully, uh, you guys are excited to see more content coming and some awesome videos. I'm really, really excited for them. 
Uh, the guesstimate for the, so thank you again, Diana. Everyone say thank you, Diana. Uh, my estimate on the 33 engine static fire this month, maybe I personally, my opinion, if you're going to make me have to guess, you know, I hate guessing dates. I actually do think we'll, there's a decent chance we'll see the 33 engine static fire this month. I, th I actually do believe that. Um, Douglas, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And hello, Vermont. Uh, Steve, thank you for becoming a member. I appreciate it. Um, this is from Samuel. When the Starship vents during testing, do they vent propellant straight into the atmosphere, or do they do, or they do, or do they recycle propellant? For now, more or less, um, the oxygen is always vented straight into the atmosphere. That's obviously, frankly, kind of a good thing. <laughs> um, depending on what what part of the, the you know, remember there used to be that flame stack that we'd see like with Star Hopper and stuff. These days, a lot of it's recaptured and able to be recompressed and, and put back into the ground system. But there is still occasionally the venting of methane. Um, as we saw with the, the big, that big kaboomy was during the spin-up process, it still dumped a decent amount of methane out into the air. That has now been, they're not going to be doing it that way anymore. But uh, yeah, the, for the most part, uh, and that's actually something that has to be very well uh, studied and and taken care of because obviously methane is actually a really powerful greenhouse gas. So that actually has to all be reported uh, back to the EPA. So they have a certain limit on how much, how many tons they can, uh, they can vent into the atmosphere without burning. It's actually better if you burn it. It's methane's better to be burned because you end up with some carbon dioxide and water vapor. So it's not much different. We've actually run the numbers on how much carbon dioxide it is to totally, uh, how much CO2 it is when you completely deplete an entire super heavy booster. And it's up there with, you know, uh, hold on here, let's just look it up. Uh, pollution. Hmm. That didn't work very well. I'll type in pollute. <laughs> pollute. How much do rockets pollute? So we did, we did this video three years ago now. Can you guys believe it? This was one of my first, like, Tim Dodd lost his mind making a video. Um, here you go. We have the CO2, 2,600, 2,700 tons of CO2 would be released during a full Starship Super Heavy launch, which makes it more or less. But then we go, this is interesting. When you start going into CO, like the comparison of like how much payload, like your CO2 to payload ratio, it's actually not as bad as the Soyuz even, which is crazy. Um, it's, and it's more like a reused Falcon 9. Uh, let's see here. But then we even compare it to do, 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 rockets versus airliners. So yeah, a per passenger, this is actually, if you had a hundred, wait, how many did we do? We, I think we made it more conservative on some of them. Uh, da, da. I don't, we should, oh, there we go. hundred and hundred for Starship Super Heavy was like, Nowadays, that seems ridiculous. Although, the, here's the crazy thing. The Starship, the pressurized volume, what, what you actually have like in what could be habitable space, is bigger than a 747's pressurized volume. I know that seems insane, but there's actually more volume inside the, the payload area of a Starship. So, you could imagine that it wouldn't be absurd to put 400 people in a bigger space um, as you would on a 747, especially if these people are only riding on a vehicle, like for Starship on its own, if to, to do point to point, we're only talking about like a 45 minute flight. You could literally be like standing up almost. You could pack people in there like sardines. So 400 is actually relatively conservative, um, but a hundred on like a full stack. I don't know what you're doing sending a hundred people into orbit. That's a bit ridiculous. But anyway, you do see the total uh, CO2 per passenger. It is greater than that it's almost 10 times greater than that of uh you know riding in a 747 but yeah there's all that number i don't know how did we get on that rant anyway you can look at all, all that if you watch that video that's still the <laughs> skip through the first five minutes i don't know why i had the longest intro ever in that video stupid <laughs> i've learned lessons i try to get you to that intro screen in like a minute nowadays and that that one was like five minutes of stupid uh invincible turtle uh, saw it live. I, you wish I was there. I wish I was, uh, definitely wish I was there over the USS F-44 fog mission. That was horrible. So thank you for saying hi. Thank you for your, your donation and congrats on seeing a beautiful launch. Uh, wouldn't it be interesting to see a live video feed from the Expendable Center Corps from 
Miko all the way to the ocean. Uh, I don't know if the expendable one, we probably wouldn't see a live feed because once it starts to enter, it, it gets, you know, totally surrounded by plasma. And then that plasma prevents data transmission, especially if you're if you're going really fast. Like the boost back burn prevents a lot of that plasma from from destroying. Nowadays, you know, they kind of we can actually see some of those uh, those missions live from launch to landing because they slow down enough, and Starlink and all these other technologies have actually made it so it's it's, it's possible to transmit through that. But um, yeah, with this, I think once you'd see the plasma, you just kind of see the video cut out, unfortunately. But there are some awesome videos of launch to landing. From that from that booster shot, and it is awesome. So thank you so much, Cash. I appreciate that. Oh, that's cool. I love that's awesome, Invincible Turtle. Thank you again for saying hi and learning and teaching others. Very cool. From John, you're freaking awesome. Can I get a shout out to my little girl Victoria? It's her birthday weekend, eight years old. Falcon Heavy Launch was literally the cherry on top. Very cool. Happy birthday, Victoria. Everyone in chat wish Victoria a happy birthday. Very cool. I hope you guys were watching Falcon Heavy together. Uh, cheering it on. That is, that sounds like an awesome, awesome birthday. I hope that maybe, I mean, maybe on my birthday I could get a launch. Please. Starship launch would be great. My birthday's at the end of February. That'd be awesome. Uh, Atlas Gaming, thank you so much for the membership. Same with Bryce. Thank you so much for the membership. And, um, MM Glean Gow. MM Clean Gow. Sorry, I totally, yeah. Uh, in terms of fuel, how many Falcon launches are equivalent to one Starship launch? Uh, yeah, we actually had that pulled up here a second ago. We can talk about that since it's already pulled up. Um, okay. In terms of fuel. So I guess we have to kind of add up all the stuff. But as in terms of fuel, Falcon 9, what was it? Falcon 9 or Falcon? Falcon 9, CO2, 425 versus Starship 7. So it's six-ish. About six Falcon uh, Starship Super Heavies. At least in terms of CO2. Um, no soot though. That's good. Nitrous oxide, the, the, the NOx, like uh, nitrous oxides are basically just from the afterburning effect of a rocket, uh, burning oxygen in the air and or oxygen and nitrogen in the air. Um, yeah, there's no chlorine. That's good. Alumina also not great, but yeah, there you go. Uh, and that sounds about right. It, it, I think there's about six times as much propellant mass on starship uh thank you so much clyde for the the donation uh kai great to hear from you hey tim do you have an opinion with a new company stoke space on their rocket which includes the reusable multi-nozzled aeros by second stage of course i have an opinion i have a whole i did a walkthrough with them and i will be releasing that after the how do you start a rocket engine video and I actually use some of the clips from that interview uh with with andy lapsa the ceo and it is awesome i I'll have to restrain. I'll, you'll have to wait and see. I, I get to I get to release some things for you guys that you'll have never seen before, and it is honestly very, very, very exciting. So I am, I'm loving it. You're gonna love it. It's gonna be great. I'm planning to fly from England to watch the Starship launch live. What's the best spot to watch from? And any other tips? If if they allow the southern tip of South Padre uh, to be open, so let me show you guys this again. We'll just throw up maps. So the southern tip, I, I would love to try to get that video done too of like where to watch from because that's one that I started and then got too busy to finish. Okay, so here is, oopsies. I just dragged a screen around in OBS. That's not what I meant to do. Okay, uh, Starship launches right here. Up here is Isla Blanca Park on South Padre. This is an awesome, awesome view. Um, you're, this is about as close, this is as close as you can get which is why I'm nervous there's actually a chance this whole area might actually be blocked off during the launch. If that's the case, I honestly think the beach, just up and down the beach here on South Padre will be an awesome view. Um, you also have a decent view in a couple places in, in Port Isabel. Don't stop on the bridge. Whatever you do, do not stop and try to be on the bridge anywhere. Very bad, very dangerous, not good. I'd say your beach, if Isla Block is closed, the beach is probably your best bet. Don't try to go anywhere west, uh, like over here, you're going to be so far away and actually another decent place. There's a couple pull-offs here on 48, like this boat ramp and stuff. These actually might be pretty cool views, honestly. Um, that would be a, another consideration. The other thing I would say is book your trip as late as humanly possible. I know that's hard to do with people with planning. 
book it literally definitely don't consider booking until you see the 33 engine static fire and see it go successfully i would almost consider if you can wing it don't even consider flying over here until they get a launch license in hand that's gonna be a lot tighter because that might happen the the day before or day of we'd see it uh, as we did with, I think, SN9 or SN10 was that way. I think it was SN9, actually. We were literally, like, waiting for them to get the launch license. So, that and that will be published, and that will be public. Something that we'd hopefully be able to find and, and catch before flight. But I definitely would not consider booking a flight. And give yourself as much time. I would say give yourself, if you can, if you can do at least a week, you're going to need as much time as you can, for sure. <laughs> I wasn't even showing off the Aerospike T while I was talking about Aerospikes. You're right. Aerospike T-shirt. The best T-shirt. Um, <laughs> with the rapid speed of the rapid Raptor engine production, do you think other companies will use the Raptor engine for their rockets? And will SpaceX be open to selling the Raptor? I don't think SpaceX has interest in selling the Raptor to other people. I think they'd rather just use it themselves and profit off of the launch services. I don't think they have interest in selling the engine like like Blue Origin has done with the BE-4. That's my that's my opinion, um, but I, I really don't have anything to back that up. Uh, what is the thrust to weight ratio of the side booster? Of just a side booster? I don't know. I don't, if you launch just a side booster, like say you launch a side booster without anything else on it, so no second stage or fairing, a payload, it'd probably be over... Two to one, I would guess. Yeah, I don't actually know. I don't know. Um, that's nothing, something I've never thought about. But obviously, altogether, um, you know, it's it's a pretty, it's a relatively high thrust weight ratio. That the Falcon Heavy gets off the pad pretty quick. Um, Mike Acres, if you had the option to take a New Shepard flight tomorrow versus waiting for Dear Moon, would you take it? I I would I would not take it over Dear Moon. Absolutely not. Um, I had the option. I almost got a ride on New Shepard and would have done that in with the Dear Moon. Like I had to let them know that I, I, you know, had to make sure that was okay, that I had pursued the option of maybe flying on New Shepard. I had that, uh, that someone basically invite me. It was, a, it was down to, to me and Dude Perfect. Uh, and it ended up being Kobe from Dude Perfect flew on New Shepard um, with the uh, Moon Dow. And yeah, it ended up, I, I lost by like 1%, which is crazy. Uh, I, and I would have probably, you know, by, for all reasons I know, I would have been able to fly on both with no problems. So, um, I would not choose New Shepard over, uh, Deer Moon. I would choose both. <laughs> Bazinga, Starship worries me. Odds of it tipping over on landing on the moon or Mars with no flat surfaces since so top heavy. Well, we haven't seen the landing legs yet for uh, lunar missions and Mars missions. There's a good chance that they're very wide. Don't forget that this is as tall as a the, the Starship itself, the upper stage, is about as tall as the Falcon Heavy booster. But it's already, instead of being 3.7 meters wide, it's already 9 meters wide. So it already has a much bigger diameter. So if you can extend that the legs out even just a little bit, uh, you'll have a nice wide stable stance. So I, I wouldn't... I wouldn't worry about it yet. I'm sure they're thinking about it and considering it. And they, what well, we've not seen everything yet. You know, until we see the actual HLS stuff, uh, I'm not that worried about it yet. Um, what do I think of For All Mankind on Apple? That's one of those shows I have watched some of it. I did not fall completely in love with it. I need to fall back in love with it. I need to watch it. I think I was distracted when I was watching. And it's one of those shows you can't be distracted while watching. I, think I was trying to work and watch or something. And so nothing was actually being absorbed at all. I need to watch it. It's like my dream show, basically. I mean, come on. Like, alt history with Soviet Union? Come on. That's right up my alley. But um, I need I need to dedicate to watching it instead of uh, half watching it. Uh, but I know it's really well done. And I know it's really good. John Depker. This might be off topic, but I have an idea for an in-depth video. How different rockets get fueled up at the pad? Yeah, I, I definitely want to do one about ground systems at some point. That is one of those things that I'm still learning about. Um, I'm, if you're, if you're noticing, I'm, I'm trying to do like a whole bunch of kind of the more generic, like, uh, rocket videos like this. And that's a perfect example of one, uh, is how do you, what's the logistics, you know, and how do you, yeah. How do you fuel a rocket up before flight? Thank you so much, John. I, I, I've, I literally will put it on the list for sure. Uh, Larry, thank you so much for the tip. I appreciate it. Uh, Thomas, um, Marduez. Thank you so much for becoming a member. 
Uh, Reed Bowman. Hey, Reed, how you doing? Uh, Tim, how well do you think you'll be able to sit back and soak in the experience of Dear Moon to translate it later into music, not just videos? I don't know. I don't know. I have no idea how it's going to affect me and what it's going to inspire. And I have no idea. Yeah. Um, man. I, and that's even honestly something that I told them during the selection process. I said, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what types of works I'll make. I don't know how I'm going to be inspired. So I'm not going to like pitch anything to you. Really. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to be there. And here's my, here's my skill set. Here's what I like to do. I would love to live stream and, and help on that end of things. Um, but this is, this is what I do. So I don't know. Um, I don't know what music or if I'll be doing music from it. I have I have no idea, but good question. I'm excited to find out myself. Uh, Invincible Turtle again. This is for you. I was at Kennedy Point Park and I screamed, subscribed every day, astronaut. <laughs> that is awesome. You'll watch me go on that rocking person. I can't wait. I hope to see when 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 Starship flies with for Dear Moon. Oh my God. I hope all of you guys can make it out. That will be crazy. That will be absolutely crazy. 24 months of membership. Uh, do I talk with Felix, Angry, and the other broadcasters? Yeah, I do. I, uh, yeah, lots of times I'll, you know, have some messages with a lot of the people. You know, you know, a lot of the people that I that I interact with are people that I know personally and like have run into a handful. You know, like I've, I've you know, I'll message Felix and stuff a handful of times. I'm really close. Uh, you know, have become really close friends with a lot of the NASA space fight guys because we have been going to the Cape together for seven years. You know, I just have a lot of almost eight years now, seven years, nine years. Oh my God. 2014. Uh, I think I missed, well, I don't think I met Chris G though until like 2016 or 17, but still, I mean, long history with a lot of these people. So they, they, you know, we're peers. There, there's a lot of, and a lot of us hang out like in between launches and stuff, you know, after lunch, we'll go and have dinner and stuff. And it's, it's super, to me, that is like, that's definitely part of the, the team space attitude is, uh, is is the friendships that you make along the way and the, the connections and the the camaraderie. You know, a lot of us are in it together with the long days and the scrubs and the disappointments and the the highs and the lows. And you check in on how, how are your shots? Like, you know, like, yeah, it's, it's very fun. And I'm like, you know, Jack Byer has, you know, from NASA Space Flight will stay with us sometimes and things like that. And yeah, it's all, it's all, it's an awesome community. Really fun group of people. I love, I love reaching out to people and, and, See, you know, but lots of times there's stuff that you can work on together and, you know, yeah. But yes, the answer is yes. Uh, this will be the last one. David, thank you so much for 25 months of membership. Thank you for all you do. You make learning about space fun and understandable. Keep up the awesome work. Well, thank you so much, David. I do appreciate that. With that, my voice is sore. We streamed for two hours on the dot, basically. I think it is time that I head out. So uh, one last time, thank you guys so much for tuning in with me. Uh, remember, I did make it so we get 10% off of the Aerospike shirt. If you guys, we were talking about Aerospikes because they're awesome. When aren't we talking about Aerospikes? Uh, I do have, we do have the limited edition. We did a second run of the shirt for the first time in three years, I think now. Uh, the Aerospike shirt, awesome, awesome shirt. One of my favorites. Uh, yeah, get it before it sells out. I think some of them already did sell out. Maybe we... Did we go over them? I don't know. I'm pretty sure we did sell out on some of them. So if you do want 10% off the Aerospike shirt, go to everydayastronaut.com slash shop. Use coupon code launchday, all one word, all lowercase, for any of the Aerospike shirts. Uh, today only, basically. It'll be up for the next 24 hours. So thank you guys so much for hanging out with me, sticking around for a long time. This is awesome. I really appreciate it. But that, my friends, is going to do it for me. I'm Tim Dodd, the Everyday Astronaut, bringing space down to Earth for everyday people. Goodbye, everybody.